you very much, uh, Dahi and the Institute, for uh, inviting me to, to come today. Um, very broad subject, debt crisis, Europe and Irish policy responses. Um, but I'm going to try to focus on, in on three specific topics, which I think are, are fairly important, um, but it's not intended to be an all-encompassing overview of all of the issues. Um, I'll try and be fairly concise, and some of the points I make I may not perhaps develop as much as I'd like in my remarks, but there's always the uh, discussion and question and answer session. Now, um, I've decided to focus on three issues. One, um, a rather crude title, paying the debt. And second, what I think is a conceptually somewhat different issue from paying the debt is the future architecture of the euro area. And third, I'd like to talk about lessons um, uh, from, for Ireland from this experience. And the lessons I will offer are maybe a little bit less conventional um, than some that are talked about. So, with that, let me address the first uh, issue, paying for the debt. Um, now, I believe this is useful to conceptually distinguish between the issue of how we deal with the current stock of debt, if you like, the mistakes inherited from the past and the excesses of the last 10 years, and how, um, going forward, if you like, we try to fix things such that there is not a repetition of what happened. But even if we don't go forward very well, or there's a lot to be done there, there is still the issue, even if the euro area were to collapse, of paying for the debt. And the way I look on this is that debt does not go away. Um, you have a lot of schemes and proposals and suggestions for dealing with the debt, um, and some of them give the impression that we can kind of get rid of the debt by just some sort of paper transactions. But in fact, um, debt does not go away, and what happens to debt is it's paid for. And many of the proposals that um, are discussed essentially involve significantly um, different distributions of the bill between different entities, be they countries or within countries or institutions and so on. I'd like to just go through these in order to clarify um, some of the issues. Okay, the first is obviously austerity. We all know about that. There's nothing much to say in the sense that uh, the debtor pays. The second set of things is a rather large sort of package of, of proposals and schemes, and we hear, you know, one every day or one every week or one every month. And all of these essentially involve um, assigning the bill to, um, to certain places. Um, and when you sort of unwrap all the silver wrapping, peel back the onion, um, you actually find that most of these end up, broadly speaking, in a certain place. Whether they be debt write-offs or schemes such as ESM buying bonds, ECB buying bonds, ECB lending money to the ESM to buy bonds, ESM giving money directly to, to, to banks and so on. There's a whole um, list of these. But um, essentially what all of these proposals um, involve is either in some cases, if it's a debt write-off, a direct cash payment, or the assumption, if you like, by these other entities of risks um, of non-payment, which over the long term could mean the same thing. Risks which the market is not um, prepared to bear at the moment, at a, at a reasonable price. And what this actually means is that uh, when you look behind most of these schemes, um, most of the bill ends up um, what I call on the road to Berlin. Now, northern countries more generally, but for shorthand purposes, let's call it you know, Germany and Berlin. There's nothing wrong with this, but I think it's important to realize that the issue in this set of proposals, if you like, essentially comes down to the question is Germany, for shorthand purposes, prepared to pay the bill that is involved in all of these different schemes in order to, um, to fulfill a wider goal, such as the um, continuation of, of the euro? Um, and sometimes this issue is not put as clearly as, as I think, analytically, at least, it should be. Well, we can discuss whether they should do that or not, and whether it's in their self-interest to do it or not. That's a different issue, and we'll come back to that in the discussion. But that is really the heart of, of the issue um, at stake. Now, there is a third way to pay debt. It's the only way left, which is essentially if you can't get more out of austerity, political limits, if taxpayers are not willing to directly put their hands into their pockets and to pay via the ESM or the ECB for, for the other solutions. And by the way, I say that because the ESM and ECB, the reason that this ends up with Germany is not very uh, mysterious, it is that Germany uh, is the major shareholder in the ESM and the, uh, in the ECB. But if you can't do that, there is another way. Um, it's a very bad way, it's the worst way, 
But actually, governments over the centuries have often resorted to this um, scheme, which is to essentially try and inflate the debt away. This is not something I propose, although I have written about it, um, and there are many costs and redistributive issues involved. But my point would be that um, if, if you can't bring yourself to pay directly the bill out of the, and get the taxpayers to pay, to pay it out of the second set of alternatives, then actually what governments can do and have done is stolen the money, if you like to put it crudely, out of people's pockets by inflation. This is a very bad way, but it can end up that way. And unfortunately, if A and B may not necessarily produce the results, and I think Germany has to be aware of this, one could end up, regrettably and unfortunately, with a bit of, of the inflation route. As I say, scoundrel governments over the centuries have resorted to some element of that. Now, second area I wanted to talk a little bit about is the future architecture, which I think is conceptually a different issue from the question of paying the bill. Even if the euro area were to disappear, in fact, we would still have the problem of who paid the bill. But let's assume, let's assume we want to continue with the euro area. What are the essential elements? And I'll distinguish between the necessary elements and other add-ons in a moment to make a currency union work. I'm drawing a little bit on my own experience with currency unions elsewhere in, in the world over the years. Okay, the essential elements are, in my view, essentially three. First, you obviously need a common monetary policy. One interest rate fits all. You might say that's not controversial. Not so far, it hasn't been. Let's hope it might not be in the future. I would say, for example, that this is not to be taken for granted. For example, the breakup of the former Soviet Union ruble area, which was one of the last great breakups of a currency area, it broke up on economic grounds because Russia wanted to maintain a very expansionary inflationary monetary policy, and most of the other countries did not, and so they decided there was no alternative but to up and go, and they did. Actually, they did with the support of the IMF. Second element is, of course, the fiscal compact and everything that goes with it. The reasons are fairly obvious, free rider problems, and so on. Otherwise, we, we, we know about that. However, that was there on paper under Maastricht, but it wasn't followed, at least effectively. The third element, which Governor Honan spoke very eloquently about, and which I think is absolutely critical and essential, is the pan-European financial regulation system. Totally missing in the 10 years up to the crisis. Countries left to their own devices, and we know many of them didn't do a good job. Why is this an essential element? It is because, first, we have contagion. So if a bank failure in country X happens, it actually matters to, to country Y because of the uh, common, um, commonality between the banking systems. And second, of course, you might say, well, you know, um, if we have the fiscal compact, we'll be all right. But the problem is that when banks fail, as we know only too well, it's a long history of this, governments end up unfortunately, throwing out fiscal compacts, deficit rules out the window, and actually coming out and saying we have no alternative but to bail out the banks. And we all know, in Ireland's case, what happened. So essentially, given this political reality that governments will bail out banks, you've got to have something there which will prevent this problem from arising. Otherwise, your fiscal compact is going to get blown. Otherwise, you're going to end up where we are now. Now, there are, however, things that have been talked about a great deal, including over the last weeks and days and months, which I think should be distinguished from what I call the essential elements. They're what I call sort of optional extras. I don't think analytically they are essential from an economic point of view to make a currency union work. And actually some currency unions in the world work reasonably well, thinking of those in Western Central Africa and the Eastern Caribbean uh, at the moment, which do not have these elements. Let me just mention them. Euro bonds, if people meet the fiscal compact treaty, then they're not going to have a debt problem, so why do we have to mutualize the bonds? Fiscal transfer um, union, fine if you want to um, equalize um, uh, incomes and so on across countries. Not necessary for a currency union, maybe very desirable in its own, its own right. Common deposit insurance scheme, maybe, maybe not. I could see analytical arguments that that is nice to have, but not necessarily option, uh, necessary. And political union. Now, all of these things, I am not arguing in favor of them or against them. I think we all have opinions on them, and they're more politically based, if you like. But what I'm just making the point is that um, one should not necessarily argue in favor of these on the grounds that they're essential for a currency union. Some currency unions work quite well without them. Of course, politically, might, someone might say, well, we have the other planks, the fiscal compact and so on. 
but maybe they won't work. So we need backstops. We need a, you know, a double lock, a triple lock. So we have a fiscal union. And then we'll, that maybe, to, you know, copper fast that, we'll put on top of a political union. And I can understand that that's, you know, a point of view. But speaking as an economist, economists tend to dislike redundant constraints. It's just the nature of the way we, we think. And I think that some of these things, nice if you can have them, if there's support for them, great. And let me finally say that one thing that I think is highly undesirable, not only unnecessary, but undesirable in a currency union, or indeed in any country, which is the idea that the central bank should be the lender of last resort to governments. Central banks classically are lenders of last resort to banks, to solvent but illiquid banks, and they should be prepared to lend unlimited amounts to them. But believe you me, the idea that a central bank would lend unlimited amounts to government is actually a terribly bad idea. Um, it's what Zimbabwe does. It does Argentina. I could cite dozens of countries. And if anyone ever really gets that idea going and it becomes a live possibility for the euro area, then to be honest, in my view, that would be the end of the euro area because you would have unlimited um, inflationary uh, pressures. So enough on first part or first two thirds. Ireland. Ireland policy response. Now, it could be a lot said about this, but I wanted to take a particular sort of a a line, if you like, which the risk of being maybe a little bit provocative and controversial. I want to talk about two things, how economic policy making uh, in Ireland has been undertaken over, over the last uh, while, prior to the crisis, and second, a little bit about the way we approach Europe. Now, what lessons have we learned? Well, we know, trivial point, that we're unlikely to have another property boom in Ireland, we're going to probably look after the banks more carefully, we're going to watch our budget, and so on. So it's very unlikely that we will have the same kind of crisis that we had just now, you know, for many a long day to come. But we might have another crisis. After all, we've had two in 25 years, which is a lot. And there could be another, another crisis, 10, 15, 20 years, as Donald Rumsfeld called the unknown unknowns. We know, have no idea what it is. And the question then is, have we learned from, from this experience in terms of how we go about doing things, how we go about making economic policy? so as to avert some potential future unknown crisis in the future. Now, um, what I would uh, suggest is that there are a number of clearly clear features in the pre-crisis period, which is highlighted by, by uh, Honan report, and a little more explicitly by the Nyberg report, which did identify some fairly fundamental ways, issues, I think, in terms of how, how we went about uh, doing things. And they, they were relevant, I think, for both, both financial crises. Um, first of all, um, we have a reluctance to entertain contrarian views. The record is, is, is replete <laughs> with the consensus building, the cosy consensus, the uh, disinterest in, in, in alternative points of view that permeated economic policy making um, during the 10 years up to the crisis. We had a reluctance to inject, let's say, external views and opinions into our major institutions. And I say this carefully because, you know, in my own background, I'm not trying to suggest that foreigners necessarily or people from abroad would have better views. In fact, many of them probably mightn't have had. But it is striking to notice that in the three major institutions, finance, regulator, and central bank, there was not, I think I can speak correctly on this, in the higher echelons of those institutions, there was not a single person who had had professional experience working outside the country. This is not to put forward um, foreign expertise for the sake of it, but I do believe an injection of alternative views will lead to more questioning and a greater conviction, a greater searching among, among the domestic policy makers as to whether they really are on the right track. Another element was a complete absence of risk management. What I mean by that is exploration of what I call high, uh, low probability but high cost events. Um, no, we have one consensus, the soft landing, Fine, many people may feel that's right, but did anybody think about, well, just suppose, just suppose this didn't happen. Let's, let's consider that. Zero work in the three institutions that I, I mentioned. And finally, a, a little point I would say is a reluctance, at least, again, one observes this, for people to actually say what they think. This explains to some extent why there's an absence of official records as to the thinking prior to the guarantee decision. There was a tendency think for people to say, well, let's see what the general view is and so on, and, you know, we'll see how the consensus works out. But there was a reluctance to actually say, this is my opinion, in advance of knowing what the consensus would be. 
Now, I haven't invented these ideas, <laughs> but I think they're quite prevalent, and many people you talk to who are associated with this, the crisis, or even observers outside, say, you know, these are definitely problems with the way we um, go about doing things. So the question you might say then is, well, have we, have we learned in a sense? If these are problems, let's suppose they are, have we done something different? Um, and here I, I think the, question, the answer is a little bit mixed. Yes, we have, for example, um, injected, if you like, people with extensive outside experience, both within Ireland and outside. We know Governor Honan, Mr. Anderfield, um, Stefan Gerlach, John Moran, all these people are, are bringing new, new views. And that's very good. My question is, and I do not know the answer, I hope that 10 years from now, when these people pass, and you know, the Troika has been sent packing and so on and all as well, will we have learned a little bit that lesson that it is in, intrinsically useful to have some broader experience injected? Now, a second issue, how, the contrarian issue, the debate, the disagreements. Have we learned from that? Here, I'm, again, I'm going to just put a question. I'm not entirely sure. I think there is still a tendency to somewhat be reluctant to discuss openly uh, unconventional or slightly difficult issues. And let me offer just a couple of, of examples. Um, it's often said now, it's a mantra, that the guaranteed decision of September 2008 was the absolute worst thing that any government ever did. I don't want to get into the debates, the merits of this or not, believe you me, but I think it's a complex issue. But there is sometimes I get the feeling, a little bit in the media, that anybody who would even dare to discuss this and talk about pros and cons is simply dismissed. Everybody knows that it was the worst thing that ever happened. Corporate tax regime, I hear I'm treading on another one. <laughs> There's no discussion of this in Ireland. It's a complex issue um, involving issues for Ireland, issues for Europe, issues for whatever. Um, but I do have this definite sense directly, actually, that anyone who wanted to sort of talk about these issues and put them into the realm of public debate runs the risk of being accused of not wearing a green jersey, of somehow being a bit disloyal. Well, all I can say is we do know what happened, you know, the last time the green jersey agenda um, was, was, was sort of um, put forward. And finally, and I, I don't want to make a personal political comment on this, but it was rather striking. This is just another example. Only last week, when the ESRI put forward a thoughtful set of discussions on an issue, the use of privatization funds in, in Ireland, complex issue, many sides to it. But unfortunately, this met with immediate dismissal at a high level, um, that this was essentially the musings of academic economists that was completely irrelevant. I found that striking. I won't use any other adjective than that. Um, but I'm not sure, have we therefore created the space, if you like, right now, to yet to be able to debate in a way that we never did, I think, during the period of the crisis. Have we learned from that? And are we, um, are we willing to have debate on, on controversial issues, on issues that are complex? I'm not sure, but maybe people will have a views. Let me finally um, say, um, a word on, on, on Ireland's approach to the euro, and I'm also going to be, my apologies again, a little bit provocative here. There is a perception, I think it's not, you know, a tiny perception, I'm saying it's right or wrong, that Ireland's been a little bit um, half-hearted in its approach to Europe. That we tend to think what's in it for us as opposed to addressing constructively broader um, European issues. This was arguably the case for many years before the crisis, and to some extent, one can suggest that maybe some of our responses to the current debates and the crisis issues um, reflects that a bit too. For example, contagion. Now, we all know the, the debate, the argument with the ECB about, you know, you can't burn the bondholders because there'll be contagion. Not trying to address the merits of that, but the European view um, we didn't challenge that. We didn't say, for example, no, we disagree that there's contagion, or we think contagion is small, or we don't think contagion matters. We simply didn't engage on that. We just simply said we want to burn the bondholders. And I thought that was a little bit unfortunate that we didn't address the substance of, of the issue. Um, another issue would be um, to do with um, the um, finance, international finance services tax. Do we address whether this is a good issue or a bad issue? For, for, for Europe as a whole, we tend to think of it, well, how will it affect Ireland or not? Now, I can understand that. Obviously, from a, you know, from a country point of view, um, one wants to defend one's interests. But that can lead much too much to a situation where we're seen just as, you know, 
a country that's, that's all that they contribute. But I think they, we can contribute more by engaging on, on issues serious, substantively and constructively about what are, are issues that affect the well-being of the euro area as a whole. And after all, we have as much interest in the euro area working very well as a system. And I think we can do more to contribute um, on systemic uh, issues. Um, I'm sorry, let me finish here. So that is basically my, my, my third point. I don't think we're taken sufficiently seriously in Europe. I think we could be, um, but we'd have to adopt a somewhat um, a broader approach to the way we engage and discuss, it, discuss issues. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman.